we all make on live Facebook recording. All right, we're going to do an intro. Three, let me let one in. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Pete Caliendo, Baseball Outside the Box. Another great show, another great day. Hope you're all doing well. This is a show that loves to interview baseball's best coaching minds who love the challenge, the status quo. And we have one of the best here today, Ron Washington. Not, I'm not going to go through all his background, but you all know him. He is a former major league manager, player, but also now the third base coach with the Atlanta Braves, one of the best in the business when it comes to infield, but not just that. Let me tell you, I spent, I, I got to tell you this, I spent a week in Italy with him. My wife and I, we did a, a clinic in Italy for coaches, over three to 400 of them. Outstanding. Just spending the week with him. I became the most positive person in the world because to talk about positivity, there is no word negative in Ron Washington's vocabulary. So let me welcome right away and get, let's just get rolling and get started because you're going to really love this. Let me welcome Ron Washington. Ron, I really appreciate this, man. How you doing? I'm doing well, Pete, and it's my pleasure, and thanks for that introduction. Hey, I don't even know why I ask you how you're doing, because I know how you're doing. You're always positive, and it's uh, and here's, the, here's a great place to start. Um, I want to just, and then we'll take questions from our people online. I know I've got some already. Um, I want to mention, you know, we're all kind of a product of our environment. You know, I grew up in an Italian community, Italian parents. I was very fortunate. Um, you know, and you're positive, you're energetic, you're knowledgeable, you got common sense. Um, tell us about how you grew up and how some of those things were created when you were younger. Well, I, I, I grew up in the, the ninth ward of New Orleans, um, which is uh, the, 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 the supposedly um, area that's inhibited. Um, you hear a lot about the Ninth Ward. It's the lowest area in the city. Every time it rains, it floods. Every time it floods, it floods. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, baseball has always been a part of my life. Um, I grew up in a family of 10. I was number eight of 10. So uh, my mom and dad was very busy. And I stayed busy running behind a baseball. And um, I think that's why I, I'm where I am today, because my dream was baseball. And I never let anything get in front of me that stopped me from getting that dream. Whether I had to go over it, around it, or through it, um, that's what you have to do when you have a, a goal that you're trying to reach. It's not always easy. Um, life is not easy. But you take the knocks as they come, and all those knocks does is make you stronger. Um, you know, I, I came out of a baseball academy professional-wise. I went to a trial camp in New Orleans right out of high school. Mm. Um, and I, out of 156 guys, I was the only guy chosen, which at the time, wow. I didn't make no big stink of that because I was a baseball rat. So I figured I went to this academy. They chose me. This is where I belong. And from there, um, life just turned into what it turned into. I managed for eight years. I've been coaching for, for now about 30, 40 years. Um, I love making a difference in, in lives. It doesn't matter whether they're old, whether they're young or whether they can or whether they can't. Um, you know, everybody has their point where things begin to click for them and you have to stay with them until they click. And if it don't click, you allow them to make the decision that it's not gonna click. Never on you that I made a decision to tell a kid that he can't do something because if he didn't think he could do something, I don't think he'd have been where he was. So, and, and that's just my life. And now I'm in pro ball and I'm still making a difference. Yeah, you know, you know what? You are making a difference with a lot of people. And here's the other part. And I was reading in 77, you got called up to the big leagues, but then you got, you didn't get back, called up back to 1981. Um, now, you know, for a lot of people, that's not easy. Again, the, the failure, it's not a failure, but you know, so it, it could feel like a little bit of a failure. You haven't been called up. How did you deal with that failure? Because it's easier said than done sometimes. Well, in 1977, when I got called up and then in 78, um, I, I was the next guy to get called up to the Dodgers. At the time, the Dodgers had, Bill Russell, Steve Garvey, Ron C., yeah. uh, David Lopes, Reggie Smith, Dusty <laughs> Baker, loaded. Rick Monday. They was loaded, so oh, you yeah. never win any place. But I tore my knees in 1978. Uh -huh. I had a cruciate ligament uh, and lateral cartilages tearing my left leg. And then the following year, I tore the, the, the ligaments in my right leg. So two years back to back, that's why there was a difference between 1977 and 1980 when I got called back up. And then 81 was my first full year in the major leagues, and I stuck until I retired, which was 1990. So that's why that gap was there. 
And when I had my operation, I was told by the most famous orthopedic surgeon in baseball, Dr. Joe by the California, oh, yeah. that I probably wouldn't play again. And I wow. looked him in his eyes and I told him, you don't know Ron Washington. Well, it took me about three or four more years to get my act back together. I lost my speed compared to what I had. But what I hadn't lost was my heart and my drive and the fact that I knew I could play baseball. I never lost that. And that is what keeps you going, knowing you can, even when the odds say you can't. Now, I got to ask you, where did you get that? I guess that's the main question is, you know, when you were younger, how did, it, was it the environment you were around? Was it, you know, I know in the old days, and I say old days because I'm, I'm, I'm that age, we played in the streets, we played anywhere else, you know, we played with all kinds of kids all over the place. We didn't have many coaches. I mean, was it the environment that created that? The environment and the attitude that I have, I got from my older brothers. As I told you, I'm from a family of 10. Yeah. My older brothers, we had eight boys and two girls. Ah. So me personally, when I played Little League in my neighborhood, I always played above my age. So I ended up playing a lot of ball in the neighborhood with people above my age because my age, they just couldn't handle me. That ain't a pat on the back. That's a fact. Yeah. Um, I played 15-year-old ball for three straight years because trying to play 12-year-old ball, I just was too much for them. So I played at a high level. And, you know, all of those type of things create what you are. You learn how to fail. You learn how to bounce back. You understand that failure is momentary. It's temporary. It's in the moment. It's not forever. It's in yeah. the moment. Now, if the only way it becomes forever is because that's your mindset. Your mindset has to be obstacles are always out there. That's in everyday life, getting up, going to work, nine to five, you got obstacles. So the obstacles was there. But I learned that attitude from my older brother because when I'm playing against older guys, they had tricks as a, as a young guy I didn't have. And I would come back to the huddle or come back crying, you know, and my older brothers would tell me, if you can't take it and you can't figure it out, go home. Well, I didn't go home. Mm. So I had to figure it out. And when I figured it out and the older guys would have to take advantage of me, that's when my older brothers would step up and, and take my fight on for me. So I learned that in the neighborhood. And another thing I learned as a little, as a little leaguer, I played on a team that only had 10 guys. We would play in the summertime and seven guys would show up. So we would have to forfeit the game. So yeah. I changed my territory, my high school coach, that's when right at integration there, my wow. high school coach was a white guy. He knew I could play. He needed my talent, and I needed him. So we used each other. He needed me. I needed him. But my Little League team called me a traitor. So I was way advanced as far as the mind, the body, and the soul. So I went uptown, and I played uptown on a white team, and they needed me, and I needed them. Wow. And that's the way you got to think sometimes. Well, I played with a lot of guys that was real good ball players, but they didn't go anywhere because they wasn't willing to feel uncomfortable. You can't be afraid to feel uncomfortable, especially if you know within yourself that you can do something. You just got to deal with that uncomfortability because that is knowledge. Whether you know it or not, being uncomfortable is knowledge. Why? Because you feel like you're doing something you can't do. But the other guy on your shoulder, you got two little men on your shoulder, one yep. telling you you can and one telling you you can't. And I never listened to the one that said you can't. Wow. I love that. Love it. You know, for coaches and parents out there, I know you're dealing with pro guys right now, but you also work with a lot of young kids. And folks, we're going to get into infield and managing also. Don't forget, you can ask questions. And please do us a favor. Just go to YouTube and register. Peter Caliendo, do me that favor. Um, all the shows are free. Um, Ron, Nowadays, we kind of put players, young players, into categories, 13U, 14U, 15U, into that age group. You know, again, when I played, I was 15 playing with 18-year-olds, like you were just saying. Yeah. Now, I know everybody can't play up, but, you know, what's your recommendation? Because sometimes we won't let kids play up when they're real good. Um, or possibly sometimes you may have to play down just to wait a little bit because, by, you know, anatomically, we're all different. Just because you're 12 years old doesn't mean you're 12 years old. What's your recommendation? Guys, mute your mic, please. I'll get them. Go ahead, Ron. My recommendation is if your kid want to play, it's not about when you're young 
about failing. It's about trying. It's about dealing with the failures. It's about trying. And as a coach, we all have kids that have zero talent, but they are part of the whole group. Mm. So the, the, the zero talent kids are the kids that you have to put out front so they can grow what I want to say, confidence. Because everybody there know the kids that can and the kids that can't. But if you put the kid that everybody think that can't out front and give him attention just like you give the ones that can, you end up getting the whole group. I wrote some things down. You know, when, when you're developing kids, you got to develop a strict, strict process of attitude. And the number one thing is they got to be on time. The number one, the number two thing is show up and do the work. Now, you do the work. You may not do it as well as another one, but the process of going through it on a daily basis will all of a sudden bring him to an even kill. He may only go so far, but that's because his talent level is not as great as maybe the kid that keep going. That's just the fact. The third thing is, is to make sure that they know that they always got to give their best at everything they do, everything. Whether you get the results you're looking for or not, all I want to know is that you do your best. And if you did your best and you do it on a daily basis, they're going to be growth. There's no growth if you're not doing your best. And there's no growth if you don't pat them on the back and uh, applaud them for the best that they're giving you, even if it's not what you want to see. That's the best they got to give right now because you know your wisdom knowledge was, will make a difference as you continue to work. The fourth thing is be positive. Make your positivity contagious. Make it contagious because all of a sudden they start to expecting it and the next thing you know, they start to expecting it out of themselves. Have attitude and gratitude. You gotta have both of those. Every day we have a choice. You either can have a bad attitude or you can have a good attitude. You control it. At all costs, you control it. And the sixth thing is, is having passion. You really, really, really have to have passion for what you're doing. And that, that, that right there, you can grow into passion. Passion isn't something that you say, okay, you have. Well, you've got to like what you're doing. And if you like what you're doing, you take the ups and you take the downs. That's the passion. Ron, you know, and I love all this. And I got to ask you, you know, when it comes to, you've been doing this a long time and you haven't lost your passion, enthusiasm, energy, you know, and it's a daily routine that you have, you know, and sometimes that daily routine can get old. What do you do to keep yourself fresh and to keep yourself the way you are? Well, you never give everything you got. You got to keep something back for the time when you have to give something else. So that's how you keep it going. You give all you got to give at the moment for the people that are involved that you feel that they can handle. And the one thing you never do, you never think a kid can't handle advancement. You never think he can, can't handle advancement. You give it to him. Some get it now, some get it later. Some don't get it at all. And those that don't get it at all, they didn't have the passion, they didn't have the compassion, they just didn't have the attitude for it. Sometimes the game run you away. Not you. Sometimes the game itself, because the game is full of failure. Think about it. Ten times you get an opportunity. You succeed three times, you're a superstar. The other seven times, you couldn't do that in football. No. You couldn't do that in basketball. That's the beauty of the game of baseball. So you, you, you just can't give up. You just got to keep pushing. You know, one of the things that you're known for, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're, and we're going to get into managing, but you're a player's manager, but also you can also, you're straightforward. You tell players what you think. Um, just talk a little bit about that because there's a fine line there. Some guys, I mean, I think most players like to hear what you think, but maybe some players don't. Well, I think when you look at your players, you got to know who you can push. You got to know who you can back off. You got to know who you can hug. And you got to know who you, who you can't hug and can't push and can't kiss. You as the the one that's setting the stage, it's your program. And if it's your program, you have to make certain that the same things that you want to have happen have to be there every single day. You can't be one way one day and be another way another day. 
they call that leadership. Mm. And when you, when you talk about leadership, um, your time is important. You can never try to get through something just because of, of, of time. You're cutting something short because of time. No, 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 no. That's where you have to be prepared and you have to have a program. And your program have to run to a finish. Your program have to run to a finish. Your energy is important. Your beliefs is important because these kids absorbs everything. Mm -hmm. So when they hear you talk about things, they bringing it in. And you can't come tomorrow and talk differently than you talked the day before. So you have to have passion too as the leader about what you're doing. Your mindset. They're going to take, they take whatever you show them about your mindset, that's the creation that they are going to become. they kids. They absorb. Some of them pretend like they're not listening, but they do, especially when they see consistency. Uh, your thoughts. You've got to watch how you say things and how you put it out there because it may hurt feelings. So you got to be aware of your thoughts. You always got to be more aware of what you're doing than what, the, what you're trying to get the kids to do. Um, your behavior, very, very, very important. And your emotion. And that's how you keep things going with those simple things right there. And I'm more than certain that there's coaches out there that has all of that. And if you do have all of that, every day show it. Every day show it because believe me or not, the day will come when you'll be able to look at your group and you'll be so proud of them because you see the things that you've been pounding, you've been upset about, um, you had to ream a little butt on, and you'll see it all coming together out there and you sitting there like a proud papa. And that's what you want, even as a coach. I want to watch, I want to prepare them, and then I want to let them loose. And I, don't, I want to watch all the things we worked on, all the things we talk about just come into fruition. Love it, love it, love it. Now, you came, before we get into infield, you came from the famous academy Kansas City Academy in the 70s. Uh, you are, I believe, you are Washington and Frank White were two of the players that were produced out of that academy along with yourselves and others. And in those days, it was all about skills. Uh, what, you know, throwing, fielding, running speed, all that. Um, can, you, can you take that system now or do you have, to com you have to combine it with other things to develop players? That system still works. But what you have to do is be able to adjust. You don't want clones. So if you have to change the way you do things to benefit the people that you're trying to do it for, you do it. But you don't go past your ideals. You don't pass your ideals. I'll make an adjustment. And I'm only going to make that adjustment. Why? Because I have to, to continue to get this kid to move where we need to get him to do. But I'm not going to change my ideals about things. And my ideals are what we learned in the academy. Fundamentals. Always thinking about doing the right thing. Always preparing to do the right thing. Always working to do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing may take a while. And also in this game, Pete, you can do the right thing and still get the wrong results. Yeah. That's the beauty <laughs> of this game. But if I'm going to get wrong results, I'm going to get wrong results because I did it right. And you always got to pound that home. Do it right. Hit the cutoff, man. Um, when you get on the base pads, know what's going on. Pick up your sign. Make sure you know where the outfielders are. Okay? Make sure all of those things is, is done. Make sure you know when the ball is put in play. If you're going first to third, you don't have to look to see if you got to go first to third. You know because you already checked the outfield. You know where the ball is hit. You done already took care of things. So it's those type of things that are missing in the game today because the game today is still a great game, but it's more about the talent. It's not about the shape of the game itself. You don't see no bunning. You don't see no hit and run. People, people don't want you stealing no more. They want you to be aggressive on the base pass, but if you make a mistake, they're losing their mind. Yeah. Well, you can't say aggression in one sentence and say passive in another sentence. It's either all aggression or we all passive. And I can't play on a ball club, and I can't control a ball club. That's passive. You make mistakes, you learn from it. As long as they learn from their mistakes, you're going to be so happy with what you see as they continue to gain experience, continue to gain knowledge, and continue to gain control of themselves. That's the one thing with young kids. They don't have control of themselves. 
but that comes with experience. Mm. And the game of baseball is getting away from that because these young kids are coming in already talented. And when they come in at 20, 21 years old, they want them to be 25 and 26. Why? Because their talents say that they can do some things, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the know-how. They don't have the, the grind within them yet of what high-level baseball is. And I'm talking about the major leagues. I'm not talking about no minor leagues. They don't know what it is yet, so they have to learn, and you have to be patient. And um, those are the things right there, man. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. Love it. And folks, just so you know, I mean, this enthusiasm is not just for the Zoom. Trust me. This, this is all the time. I was with him a week. I loved it. I, I said it in Italy. He'll be back managing. I know he will because he's one of the best. Um, let's take a question. This will be a good one from Paul Gonzalez, a good friend from Peru, the Peruvian baseball national okay. team. What would you suggest coaches do so they challenge players every time especially when we do not have a competitive local tournament. Because what, what he's saying is they got to go compete against other national teams, but they don't have that high level of competition in their country. What can they do to kind of prepare for that? Well, I, I read on here belief. Okay, we may not have the competition that we're going to face, but between the baseball lines, it's not the best team that always wins. It's the team that play the best. So if you take your group and go into international play and you got your group solid in the things I just talked about, the fundamentals, not, not giving up extra outs or doing everything right, it don't take you to be the best to be successful. On that day, that's the only thing that matters is if I'm better than you today, you could be better than me down the road because I'm not going to see you again. But the key is to be better today. And you get your kids to believe in that they are good. And you never let them understand or you never tell them that the competition they are playing against is better than them. All they know is what you give them. And if you give them positivity, you give them the right things, and they show you that they're, as a group, they can play the game of baseball, only thing that matters is the day that you are playing. And Ron, in this case, you know, the major leagues, you guys have statistics and you play a lot of teams over and over. You know them real well. In most cases, so what you're saying is we, you know, we should really focus on making our players the best they can be. Don't worry about the other team. That's right. Worry about what you're dealing with. they your players. And who's going to love them the most? I am. And I'm going to let them know. I love them. I got their back no matter what happens. We can play the game of baseball because we have worked at it. We have prepared. We have went over everything that we have to go over. Y'all are ready. And the only thing that matters is the pitcher throw strikes. When the ball is hit to the fielders, y'all catch it. You throw it to the right base. When you get on the base pass, you run them. You do those things. It doesn't matter the competition. You know, and that's why it's so important when picking a manager at any level that leadership is so important because the mind is so, pop, so powerful that if you believe and you make them believe, they can overcome more things than you think. Um, I, I don't think I'm going that far out on that, am I? You are right on. You're not at far. That's the attitude right there. That's the way you prepare. That's the way you do things. Now, I might get beat. And right. if I get beat, I'm going to get beat knowing that that team that beat me was better than me on that day. Because I can look back at the game and see some things that if we would have done this and would have done that, they'd have been thinking the same thing that we're thinking right now. But reality is there are teams out there better than my team or better than your team. But when we competing, it's the team that make the least amount of mistakes and it's the team that execute when executing is called for, that's going to be successful. That could be the Dodgers or that could be the, the team that we're talking about right now, it doesn't matter. You make sure that your group believe in each other, they're accountable to each other, and if, that, if you've got that strong bond, you'll accept whatever happens out there. Awesome. And Ron's getting a lot of love on Facebook and Twitter. I see a lot of thumbs up, a lot of smiley faces. Um, you know, I wanna, I'm going to take a question here from Anthony. Uh, he says, what's the biggest difference in coaching mistakes during practice and a game? So, again, what's the biggest difference in coaching mistakes during practice and a game? In practice, you see a mistake, 
say something. Yeah. You know that old saying, if you see something, say something? Yeah. You make that mistake pronounced. And if you constantly make those mistakes pronounced and you constantly doing what you have to do to eliminate those mistakes, you won't have to worry about the mistakes in competition during the game. During the game, if, if you see something during a game that you think need addressing at the moment, you address it. If you see something happen in a game that you feel like you can wait later to talk about it and explain it, you explain it. But you got to explain whether you're in action real or if you're in practice. You got to explain. So that does not change. And you know what happens? The kid begins to realize that you love him. You're not getting on him. Because he made a mistake in practice, we stopped practice, we worked on it, we got it right. He made the same mistake in practice, we stopped practice, we worked on it, we got it right. At some point, it's going to click on the kid. And that's where it needs to click, not on you. It needs to click on the kid. And, but if you see mistakes and you just let them go, then we never get anywhere. Especially when you're dealing with youth. You can never be afraid to stop things, to get things right with youth. When the game starts, you can't stop it. Yeah, and I think sometimes, I know I fell into that, and I still do sometimes, where you're hesitant, you know, you see a kid make a mistake, but you're hesitant, you know, or maybe he's doing something wrong when they're playing catch, and you're hesitant about saying something right away because maybe you said it already a bunch of times. Um, we've got, go ahead. But, but that. you got to keep saying it. Yes. And I'm not saying every mistake they make, you question it, because like I told you earlier, you can do things right and still get bad results. Now, that's on you as the coach. You're the most experienced. When you see that, you got to say, okay, he did what he had to do. He got the bad results. But when he did what he did and it was wrong, you're automatically going to get bad results. So that's the one you correct. The one where he made the mistake, and in my opinion, with my professional eyes, I said, okay, he did what he had to do. He's only human. He made a mistake. You let it go. And what happens? The kid all of a sudden make his way to you and say, hey, Skip, what did I do wrong? I say, well, let me tell you something. If you did something wrong, I'd have met you. Yeah. You did everything right. The results was wrong. You okay. Come on, let's go. Don't worry. When you do wrong out there, I will let you know. If I don't come to you, you are right. Love that answer. You know, a lot of coaches nowadays, it's kind of, kind of shifting. You know, when I was younger, coaches would tell you something and you did it. Now you seem to see a little different philosophy, meaning they ask more questions. You know, how do you feel? What did you feel? Um, what do you think about that? And how do you balance that with what you just talked about? I think it's, that's the way it's supposed to be. Now you're having communication. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If he's right, give him right. Don't you take right just because you're the boss. Yeah. If your kid is right, give him right. Why? Because I still know more baseball than that kid. Yeah. But if he's right, you got to give him credit. That's what it's about in the game. You only deal with two things. It's either right or it's wrong. That's it. There's no fudging nowhere. Either you did that right or you did that wrong. And if he did it right, give him credit. You just got to bow down. Because he's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you keep that communication going. And I want them to ask questions. Why? Because I want them to know that I know what I'm talking about. Yes. And, you know, and some of it, I don't know, some of it seems common sense, but a lot of it is also how we were taught. Um, you know, what about if the player's wrong, like you said, maybe gives you an answer and the answer is not quite right. Now you get into a good discussion with them. Yes. If the answer is not right, I, sh I give him the right answer. And I can break it down. And I can let you know where you're wrong. And, and then we move on. I don't have no bad feelings. You don't have no bad feelings. But I want you to always remember one thing. I'm the boss. Yeah. That's don't awesome. get that. Awesome. <laughs> I'm sure the players that play for you know that 100%. You, there's no, uh, you know, around the bush or anything. You tell it straight, and I love it. Um, and they love it, too. They love it, too, because they want to be guided. They want to be taught. They, they want it bad, man. Yeah. You know, but you got those that think they know something, and that's okay. You let them talk that think they know something because the more they talk, the more they're going to make you know 
that they don't know did they squat. <laughs> you know, and I think, uh, you know, I hate to jump off the subject a little bit, but I think also that relates to parents because, you know, I like to communicate to parents a lot because, you know what, I want them to know what I know and that they don't yeah. know as much because they don't do it full time. Yeah. And then I think that's how you start gaining some respect also along the way. But you have to also let those parents have their say. Because Absolutely. if the parents have their say, you got the kid. But yeah. if you alienate the parent, the kid is gone. Yeah. But I don't ever want a parent to walk on my practice field and ask me why we're doing this and why we're doing that. I give the parents a date where they can all come in, bring their gripes, and I sit there and I'll answer every gripe. But when we on the field, between the lines, on practice, write your questions down. Don't ask me nothing while I'm out here on the field. Hey, I got to ask you this, and it popped in my head, because um, you were a manager in the big leagues, over 660 wins, I think it was. Um, you had to deal with the media. Um, isn't it the same with the media? They got questions. I mean, if you answer their questions the best you can, I mean, you know the game a lot better than they do. Does that help? Definitely. My, my philosophy was they ask questions about the game. I live it every day. Yeah. So I'm willing to answer their question. It may not be the answer to what they thought that it should be, right. should be. But what happened is in the process, they learn. Because in the game of baseball, there's more than one way to do things. You could have three things to get done, and you choose one of them, and it don't work. Now you got two left. You could have used those other two, and they didn't work. So it's a crapshoot. You watching the game from the first pitch, you make a decision from what you saw up until the point you had to make a decision, and guess what? It's either right or it's wrong. And the only time it's right is when the player execute what you gave them to do. It's wrong if the player don't execute what you gave them to do. That's when it's on you. When the player doesn't do what he was asked to do, and we've been working on this over and over and over, but that's the human nature in the game. Like I said, you could want to do it, and you can do it right, and you still get bad results. So as a manager, you make a decision. But I didn't, I didn't fluff on that decision where I had to think about it. I watched the game. A situation came up. I shot my bullet. It works or it don't work. That's what it is. That's and probably you live with it. I would assume that's the toughest thing is being a manager is try not to second guess yourself or at least learn maybe from it, but not second guess yourself constantly. And that's the key right there. You learn from it because whatever you do, it's going to happen again in the game of baseball. It's going to happen again. And you can sit there and say, Oh, here come this situation. I'm ready for it this time. <laughs> Where the other time, you know, you, you're going by what you're seeing happen and you trust the player to do something. And he didn't get it done. Because he didn't get it done doesn't mean he couldn't get it done. In that moment, he just didn't get it done. And I live with the decision I made. And I can explain the decision I made, even though I might have had three more choices. Mm. Ron, you know, and, and maybe it doesn't happen in the big leagues. I'm, I don't know. You can let us know. But what happens in a situation, you know, sometimes, you know, you make a decision. Well, you know how players are sometimes. They talk amongst themselves. Hey, that was a bad decision. Now you got this little click going on. I know you got your coaches that deal with those situations, but how do you deal with that? Because you want to stop on that, don't you, right away? Well, as confident as you want your players to know that you feel about them, your communication skills build that confidence in you too as the manager when you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So when you make a mistake, you don't have that click. Because when they make mistakes, and they make plenty of them, yes. you have their back. Yeah. So when you make a mistake, they got your back. Mm -hmm. And when the game is over, I never had a problem walking in the clubhouse when we lost a, had a tough loss, and I made a decision that sort of caused it. I'll get everybody together and said that one was on me. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, there's a lot of them that been made out there. That's on you. Yeah. <laughs> and they crack up laughing. And I go on about my business. You know, and that's great leadership, and it leads to, and I'm going to get to the questions, guys. We've got a couple more. It leads to, you know, it sounds like 
at any level, if you're going to play this game, you got to have fun at it too. You can't take it so serious all the time. You got to have fun at it. And the way you have fun is you make sure that you do the things right. You just don't get out there and throw out the batting balls. You get out there and you have these kids understand what the game of baseball is about. Executing of the fundamentals, doing things as a group. I'm accountable to each and every one of my guys, even if we 14 years old. Mm -hmm. You as the, the leader in charge is the one that make that happen or develop that type of attitude. Accountability, as I said earlier, being on time, show up to do the work, and you the one that create all of those things. And if you don't create all of those things, that's when you get to the point where you got clicks. But nobody have a chance to, to click if you're consistent in what you're preaching, and you got to get your best player on board. Hmm. You got to get the one guy that everybody respects. It might be three guys. It might be four guys. You got to get those guys on board with what you want to see happen between those white lines. And if you got those guys on board, everybody else don't have a chance to get out of control. And when they have issues and they come to me with the issues, I solve the issues. I don't let it linger. I solve the issues. So every day we show up, we got one thing on our mind, unity. And our mindset is to go out there and whip on whoever the opponent is. Now, we may come up short, but when the game is over, we all gonna know what happened. They beat us because tonight they played better than us. They didn't beat us because we gave them ball games. They didn't beat us because we played lackluster ball. They beat us because tonight they was better than us. Tomorrow, we knew where our weakness was tonight. They won't be there tomorrow. And if that's the best that team have to offer, they don't have a chance. Wow, yeah. You know, as a manager during the game, you know, I got a feeling you don't sit still. Um, you're constantly on the move, uh, constantly talking, constantly looking at things. Um, you know, some managers have different personalities. Yeah. Um, your type of personality is who you are, and that's what you carry in the managing during the game? My personality is I'm a player. The things that they're out there doing, when I played, I did them well. I ran the bases. I stole bases. I executed. I bunted. I hit behind runners. I hit and run. I played defense. I did everything. And I did it with pride. So when my kids are out there playing, I'm with them. I'm with them. I'm playing too. That's why I don't keep still. You know, I, you see guys, you see other managers, and, and that's they that's they thing. That's something style. great, something great happened out there. You don't see no emotion. Right. But for me, something great happened out there. I'm excited as everybody in this dugout and everybody out there on that field. You know, and I read that because I read players who said, I love playing for Wash because he's in every pitch. He cares about every pitch, every swing, all the time. Um, and it's contagious. Other, yes. That's another word I use, contagious. contagious. It's contagious. Be positively contagious. That's the stuff I wrote down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, now, I know you've done a lot of work with inner city baseball, very important, especially youth baseball. You do a lot of work in New Orleans, but also around the country for MLB. And because this question comes directly from Jerry Bruce, and I got to assume Jerry's an inner city coach. He says, how can inner city baseball players catch up with no real development systems? As a high school coach, how do you curb the gap for kids in the inner city? I think that's real important. Well, that is real important. It's going to be hard to curb the gap simply because you need finances. Yeah, that's a all the other teams, all the other areas is out financing you. But that don't mean you have to be anybody's doormat. You got to take what you have and instill it in what you got. And that's where that positive contagiousness come in. They're going to stay where they are because they don't have the finances. It's, it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. But that don't mean there's many a teams that came out of those underprivileged areas that came out of there and kicked butt because they did what they had to do where they was for each other. And that is leadership. That's where the coach come in. He has to do, he has to develop that leadership and you cannot let them think about what they don't have. They got to think about what they do have and what they do have is each other. Absolutely. And since you have each other, that's power. But the only way they're going to realize this power 
is you got to make them understand it's power. Yeah. And Jerry, just so you know, Mr. Coach Bruce, uh, you know, the White Sox program here, the Aces have a great program. They've developed a lot of players. You know, they got big league guys, Marvin Freeman, and some others. Um, and they've, uh, they've got kids in college. They've got just had the number one draft pick with the Chicago Cubs, you know, come out of their program. Uh, so I think we can put you in touch if you really don't know these guys. And I'm sure Wash will be glad to help also. Well, I'll tell you, that number one draft charge by the Chicago White Sox is some kind of player. Yeah. I went to a Major League Baseball Dream Series, and um, I, don't, I, I don't think he was there, but I heard a lot about him. Shortstop, and, um, right? Yes, shortstop. Cubs so, shortstop. you know, not everybody uh, is going to fare well in the game of baseball, but each and every coach that's out there just give him your best. You give him your best, if it's meant, it'll happen, and he'll know where his roots come from. Cool, and I got a message from Jerry. He does know those guys. Fantastic, and uh, also a question from Paul Gonzalez here. How to build a unified staff of coaches when each coach has a slightly different approach to the aspects of the game? I mean, we're that's, all gonna have- that's, that's the manager's job. Yeah. They all have to get on the same page. And the thing is, make sure you hire some experts. Don't hire jacks. A jack is a guy that knows everything, but don't have any expertise in anything. So you have coaches. They all play a role. And they have to know that this is what I expect of you. 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 Now, you're my coaching staff. Any questions that you have about what I'm trying to do, you come to me. And we have a sit down and I explain to you why I want things done like this. Now, if for some reason that coach can't get on board with what I want to have happen, you got to eliminate that coach out your system. Yeah. If he's that good, take it somewhere else. Because in my system, this is the way it's going to work. You didn't just say this is the way it's going to work. You had a sit down. You tried to explain to him why your program is, 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 is done this way. And this is the results that I know through experience, through time, all of that. In the end, it's going to be all worth it. Now, that don't mean I won't take any of your ideals. But the last say-so is mine. And if you got coaches that's fighting what you're trying to do, you got to get rid of them. Bring some on and teach them what you want them to do. Absolutely. Love it. And, folks, we did not forget, you know, Ron's also one of the best uh, anywhere in the world when it comes to infield. Ron, I'm going to jump to that right now and just talk a little bit about the infield. Before I do, the first thing I'd like to start with is, you know, for exactly young kids, you know, because I think we forget to do this, and that is, you know, you got to have a glove, and the glove's got to be a pretty decent glove. It's got to be broken in correctly um, because the glove could possibly cause some issues. Are there ways that you have broken your glove or, or new ways that you, you know, you recommend for young kids to break in their gloves? First thing, you have to make certain that your kids, whomever they are, have a glove that fit them, not have a glove that they can't control. You got to put a glove on their hand that fits them. Once they get a glove on their hand that fits them, and I'm talking whatever size it is that fits them. Mm -hmm. It's easy to break it in because when you work in gloves, whether you're in an outfield or whether you're in an infield, you actually work in your hand mm. inside the glove. Now, I put my hand in an eight-inch glove, okay? I might have about a five-inch hand. I got three inches above, okay? You got to make sure that you make them put the hand all the way in the glove, all the way in the glove, not half hanging out all the way in the glove so they know where the palm of the hand is. Mm -hmm. And if they put it all the way in the glove and they know where the palm is, go ahead, and they know where the palm is, they'll be able to use the glove efficiently. Mm -hmm. But if I got half of my hand out and now I got about five inches hanging up here, I don't know where my palm is because my palm is down here. I'm not catching the ball down here. I'm catching the ball up here. I lose control of the glove. So you put your hand all the way in the glove. 
Now you got total control of that glove. If you want to stick a finger out, you stick a finger out. But you got total control of that glove. And every time you use it, you use it where your hand is inside of that glove, except for the outfield. The outfield, he has to reach for a lot of things, so he may use more of the pocket. But even though you want to use more of the pocket, turn that glove around to me. This way? Okay. See where the, see where the, 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 the pocket is, where the pocket where the palm of the glove in at the pocket. Yeah. Down at the bottom, at the pocket. Right there? No, up top. Go up a little bit. Right in there. Yeah. That's where the glove in at the pocket. That's where you want to try to center the ball at all times. Ah. Because now if you miss, look at how much you got to work with at going to the top. And look yeah. how much you got to work with going to the bottom. Oh, yeah. Because you go go miss. Here, if you go here, you might miss down lower. But you still catch it. Yeah. But you yeah. want to so go you see what I'm saying? If yeah, you, yeah. If, if, if you use the palm of your hand inside that glove all the way in, yeah. you have created an area on that glove that make up for mistakes. How about the guys that do this with their glove? Everybody break their glove in differently. As, as an infield coach, I make my guys break the glove in outward. This way. No, 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 no. No. If you, if you get your hand on the end. Right. No, the other side. Here? Yeah, but turn the glove to you. Now, this you way. pull out. Not yeah. back. Not that way. This out. way. No. Out. No. Nope. This way? That way. This way. I got now it. You're stretching the glove. <laughs> now you're stretching the glove wide open. Ah. Yeah, I've never seen that this way. And yeah. your hands always have to be in the glove like this. Not, watch this. Watch I let my hands relax. See what it does to the glove? Yeah. Now, when I do this, whole pocket. I got the whole glove. Yeah. And I have to learn when I put my hand in that glove to keep my hand inside that glove, spread it. Wow. Love it. Love now you it. have created all your glove. But watch. As soon as I let my hand relax, look what happened to the pocket. Closes. It closes. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Now, you got to start somewhere. Where do you start? With the hands or the feet when you start training? You start with the hands. You start with how to use the hands first. What happens with the hands? Whether you go glove side, the eyes, the ball, and the glove, all the way in line. And you always do it at an angle. So my glove on my hand. This is the angles that I'm trying to work when I'm catching ground balls. See how my hands are spread out? Mm -hmm. So glove side is here. Nope, not, not, not this way. It's off your shoulder at an angle. At an angle, that way. Not that way. That way. To, to, to the front of you. This way. Yes, to the front of you. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a, that's a one-handed to the glove side. Ah. Your eyes and the glove, you always see what you're doing. The backhand, you just come, don't, don't do nothing with your arm. Just come straight across like that. Now turn it over to the backside. Yeah. The eyes, the glove, and the ball, you always see what you're doing. So you're always right playing there. a backhand out there too. Wow. And then the front side, two hands. There you go. Now, That's what you're working for. When I'm ready, if I'm getting ready in a pitcher's delivery, where are my hands? A lot your of hands guys are... Everybody can do it differently, but you got to have a cup in your elbow, each cup in each elbow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just hold your glove at whatever level that you're comfortable at. You get some hold it up here. You get some hold it in the middle of their body. You work them according to where they're comfortable. And your hands work off your body like this. That's to the glove side. That's to the back hand. And that's to the front side. You know, and I love what you said because the eyes then tell the brain, brain tells the hands, everything's controlled there. If you start with the feet, then the brain really doesn't understand what's happening. After you get them to understand how to work their hands, then you put them on their feet. Mm. And you draw a straight line where they start, and then you draw lines off of that straight line at angles. So this is the angle. Can you see my arms? Yep. That's the angles. If I'm going to a ball that's hit to my glove side, my first step is out to this arm angle. What that does, feet becomes active. Once feet is active, hands will work. Backhand, when I get ready to go to the backhand, 
my, my, my right leg steps straight out on that angle, and the angle isn't created until the back leg, whether you go glove side or back side, comes. So if I go glove side and my front leg go out first, I haven't created my angle until my right leg make this move. Now, off of that, I can back up, I can go forward, or I can keep going. But you've created an angle. And once you create an angle, feet are in motion. And once feet is in motion, what you're trying to do is, when the ball is in the air, one of my feet is up. When the ball is down, one of my feet is down. When the ball is up, my feet is up. When the ball is down, my, ball, my feet is down. And that's how you create rhythm. And then you don't come to a set position until you're ready to catch the ball. Hmm. You, you see guys stop early, and then the ball is bouncing, and the ball ends up playing them. You don't stop moving until I'm ready to catch the ball. And the sequence when you catch it is I catch it, I step, and I throw. It's a three-step sequence, whether you turn in a double play, whether you're catching a ground ball. If you catch everything in rhythm, it's a three-step process. If you catch it out of rhythm, you got to get your feet back in rhythm before you try to make a throw. On the initial start, I know this is maybe it's not important, but initial start, does the foot go first and then the hands? Or they yes, go to the foot go first. Okay. And, and, and now something you've seen in the major leagues and some vision people have um, added on this and kind of talked about it on, you see a lot of guys in their pre-step jump, you know, and all that. And some vision guys are saying that, you know, your, your brain's jumping inside and that's not always good. It's, it's bad if you land flat footed. It's not bad to do that if you land on the balls of your feet. Mm. Because your balls stop your head from jogging. Now, do if you, look, if you land flat footed, your head gonna bobble. Right. If you land on the balls of your feet, your head will stay still. Love it. Now, on that, everybody has a different way to uh, prepare, right? I mean, when yes. three pack, three step. Whatever, whatever their preparation is, I'll allow them to do it. As long as when contact is made, they're off on the ball. I, I, I let you do whatever you think you have to do to be comfortable to get ready. All I'm looking for is when the bat hit that ball, your reaction. Now, one of the coaches that asked sent me an email prior, and I'm going to ask it now since it kind of fits in this category. During batting practice, there's a lot of work you do with infielders in understanding how to pick the ball up, how to get a quicker jump, um, you know, because I, maybe I know the bat angle or the pitch location. Do you train for that? Yes, we train for that. We train for contact in the zone. You got a lot of guys that that's late on a jump because number one, you have to follow the ball out of the pitcher's hand into the zone. You can't look in the zone and try to get the ball out of there because you're going to be late. Those that are on time, they're on time because they got the ball out of the pitcher's hand, tracked it into the strike zone. When it made contact, they was off on the pitch. You got those that look at home plate and the ball is thrown, and then when the ball is contact, they got a little shake before they move. Yeah. So I teach my infielders to track the ball out of the pitcher's hand all the way into the zone. Ah. And then their timing on whatever they do to get started will be on time. When they late, they late because they're looking into home plate and just getting the ball off the bat. Makes a lot of sense. And folks, just so you know, um, Ron has, you know, MLB Network's got a ton of videos if you go to their Twitter page. I'll send it out so that way you can see all the drills that Ron does because I know it's not easy always on, uh, on the Zoom. Um, you know, I want let, to, let's also get to, and you can add anything you like anytime, but let's get to the feet now, um, how those work a little bit because you said you start with the hands. Um, and, well, you know, well, let's back up a second. With the hands, when you're on two knees, I know you do a lot of drills on two knees to prepare the hands. Yes. Yes, my drills that I do start with the knee drill and all that, all I do when, when I'm on the side is prepare the hands. It has nothing to do with footwork. It's, it's strictly to prepare the hands. Wow, I lost you. You still no, there? We got, you. we got you, just went out okay. for a second. You're good. It's strictly to prepare the hands. When, when we finish preparing the hands, then we go to the field. And when we go to the field, you start to work in the feet by making them understand how to work angles. 
Mm. Because I told you, if you don't start trying to work angles, you're going to do everything flat footed. Working the angles, get the feet in motion. When the feet is in motion, the hands work. It's just that simple. It's nothing tough to it. There's nothing complicated about it. It's really that simple. Ron, million dollar question. Um, because you know, when you start with an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old, you know, some of us may think that, you know, you got to start from the real basics, you know, don't teach the backhand, just teach the, the, the ball right at you. What's your philosophy? I mean, kids should be able to do things, you know. If you got knowledge to give, you give it to them. They get it at their pace. Ah. You don't, like I said earlier, you don't ever think that they can't do something. You don't know what they can do. You got the knowledge, just give it to them. And all of us learn at our own pace. Like I say, some get it today, some get it tomorrow, some get it a month, some get it two months, some don't get it at all. But if you got something to give, you never think it's too advanced because if you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, which the game of baseball is about, repetition, you keep repeating it and you keep repeating it and you're the one giving it and you know you're giving it right, Eventually, one day he's going to come out there and he's going to show you he has it. Absolutely. And it sounds like it's a lot more fun. One of the hardest parts is for most young kids, most young players, is the backhand. Can you talk about the backhand? Because I know I saw, I saw you do that in Italy and it was some, some great stuff. Yeah. Remember when I told you when you had your glove, you start your backhand across your body. Mm -hmm. Okay? You start it across your body. And your hands and your glove is always out there. You try to cut that angle when you're going for a backhand. There will be times when you have to go straight across. But what you want to do is make sure that you put yourself in a position where both legs are, are, are staggered. When you get ready to catch the backhand, the back leg steps out. The front leg comes down at a staggered position. But you're strong on both legs. You don't, you don't catch a backhand where that back leg is bent. You see, you don't lost balance right there. Once you let that back leg bend, and I know you watch a lot of young kids catch backhands with that back leg bent. Mm -hmm. You got to teach them to stagger their legs so they can be strong. And that's where coming across your body with your hand out front where they can see. A lot of kids catch backhands going away from them. Mm-hmm instead of catching backhands going at it. Ah. That's the difference in what I teach. We catch a backhand going at it where we can see. And to be honest with you, most kids that I work with, they get the backhand better than the front side. Interesting, interesting. Now, here, here's the interesting part. When you're teaching the backhand forehand or at you, there's, there's a lot of different things that players do. They go out to get it. They come in. How far do you come in? Sometimes you can come in too much and it kick you back. I talk about that. Push through the ball. That's where, like I told you, this is how your hands work. It's in the middle. That's how they work to the middle. Glove side. That's how it work to glove side. See, I'm going at that angle. Mm -hmm. Backhand. That's how it work to backhand. And we do all of this on the ground. So when you get up, the hands is ready. Now all I got to do is get you to stagger your legs. And it's, just, it's, it's really simple. It really is. What do you say to the guys that say, you know, there's a, they slow motion, you know, major league players, and you see a major league player doing this? The thing is this. I will never change a guy that funnels. Gotcha. If he's real good at funneling. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're not good at it, then I'm going to teach you how to attack the baseball. Love it. So if you're good at funneling, I'm not going to mess with you. But if you're not good at funneling, we got to change. And change is not going to happen overnight. Change is a process. Our number one, our number two draft choice, Shoemake, was a, a shortstop out of Texas. He was a funneler. And we worked this spring. And I was explaining to one of the younger coaches from the minor leagues that was up there working with me about what I'm trying to get him to do. And every day he came out there, he would say, well, when are you going to stop him from funneling? I said, just wait. In another week, you're going to see him stop funneling on his own. Uh. Because the kid funneled all his life. But now that he's playing at a faster pace, 
his funneling is causing him problems. So I'm teaching him slow process, how to get the hands out front, how the hands work. And I say, watch, in another five days, you won't see that funnel no more. And one day I was hitting them ground balls, and all of a sudden the coach seen it. He said, he doesn't stop. I said, I told you. You can't sometimes go to a kid and say, hey, man, you can't funnel. You have to work him, keep working him the right way. And then those bad habits that you're trying to stop from happening will turn into good habits. You know, and repetition. And you have that repetition because you also, I saw you on video do it in, during batting practice. You start on two knees. I think you roll the ball or, or maybe do hops. Explain the process because then you go back and hit also. All we're doing is simulating the last hop. Once I get to the fungo, and I'm, I'm doing the last hop when I use my hand to begin with. See, I, I use my hand, throw them nice hops that they can pick up. And then all of a sudden when I get the fungo, I can handle the fungo and I can still hit them one hop. But I'm only human. Every now and then, I may hit a ball that's not so perfect. And if the hands are working right, the ball being not so perfect do not affect what they're doing. Yeah. And that's what happens when I go to the fungo. I'm still simulating one hop. And then when I get on my feet and hit them off with, off with the fungo, I'm still simulating one hop. Everything is the last hop. The ball is put in play. The only hop that matters is what? The last hop. The last hop. Yeah. <laughs> the so other one. If I get you drilled on the last hop and you know how to pick up all kinds of balls on the last hop, there's no ball that comes off a bat out there that you can't pick up. Now, will you miss some? Of course. There's no body filled in a grand. But all you're looking for is total consistency. And every infielder that I've dealt with, they've developed consistency. And that's how it happens. Those knee drills, man, they go to and not only are we doing things down there physically, when they may use their hands different down there, they will get the feel of using it differently because they understand what it's supposed to feel like when they use it right. And sometimes they say, oh, man, that was my, that was my bad. I did this. I did that. Exactly. They begin to learn what's going on themselves. And when you're working with anyone in any part of the game of baseball, you're working with them for one reason, to make them self-sufficient. Mm. Because there's always going to be someone that's going to need your attention. And Ron, I don't care how much you do, there's always going to be someone that needs your attention bad. Absolutely. And, you know, and sometimes there's a point, I'm assuming, that in your training, that now you've got to start mixing it up a little bit, and make it more game like, because it can't be the same ball that's kind of hit to you. The same thing every single day. Now, what I might do is I might get a little further off them and mm. hit a long one hop where I've been hitting them short hops. Yeah. I might hit them a long one hop, but you got to be able to handle a fungo to do that. Yeah. And the other part is, you know, sometimes I just go back to the hands for a second. Uh, actually, something you told me in Italy, and that is when you hit fungos, since you're on the fungo, that you've got to know how to hit the fungos to your infielders, like during batting practice, let's say. What you're trying to do is create rhythm in batting practice. You don't want your infield all out of whack when you're hitting ground balls. You might be hitting them too hard. You might be hitting them too soft. You got to find the rhythm where they can create the technique that you've been teaching. Mm. They can create the technique that you've been teaching. That's how you hit a, found, a ground ball. So they can create the technique that you've been teaching. And then all of a sudden, the more reps they get, it becomes habit and they don't know how to do it any other way. And when they do it wrong, right away, they know what they did. Either they stopped their feet too soon, or they didn't push through the baseball, or they did something, but they know what they did. That's where the self-sufficiency comes in. And Ron, some young kids sometimes can't get to a certain position because of flexibility and strength. Are you developing these as you go? Yes, that happens as you go along through the technique that yeah. you're doing. The technique, everything is the technique. You, you create a technique for them, and the rest is catching the ball off the bat. You know, watching the ball go into the zone, watching the ball come out of the zone. Not watch the, not watch the ball come out of the zone only. You mm -hmm. got to watch it go in 
and you got to watch it come out. And if you watch it go in, when it come out, you're going to be on it. If a ball, if you at shortstop and a ball has hit the second base, mm-hmm. you watch the ball out of the pitcher's hand go in, but the ball went to second base. Your movement has to be on that ball towards second base. But you see a lot of guys, they'll get set, the ball is put in play, and they don't react to where the ball went. If I'm at shortstop and a pitch has gone in, I see it go in, and the ball goes to right field, to the right field, I react that way also. I react wherever the ball goes. If you see a kid not reacting to where the ball goes, then he's not tracking the ball in the zone. Very interesting. And now speaking about technique, are there times where you're only using one hand? Because we have to Yes. I, I make these guys practice a lot using one hand going to the middle. Now, mm-hmm. at game time, if you can beat that ball where you can get in front of it with two hands, I don't have no problem with that. But the thing is, this is key. If you're going to try to get in front of a ball, you can't get in front of that ball and your momentum still going in the direction that you going in to catch it. If you're going to get in front of that ball, your momentum has to be stopped. Hmm. So if your momentum is still going and you're trying to work in front of a ball, um, you should have backhanded or you should have one-handed it. You uh, see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Because that way you can maintain rhythm, whether you're going to the front side or whether you're going to the back side. So if a ball is hit up the middle and I'm going to run over there and try to get in front of it, I can't have my momentum still going while I'm trying to catch the ball. If I'm going to get in front of it, I have to be able to center that ball under control. If I can't center it under control, that's where the one hand come in so I can continue to work through the baseball. Absolutely. Well, how important is when you drop a ball knowing what to do? Well, knowing, number one thing, if you drop a ball, if you're trying to field it and you drop it, you don't pick it up with your glove. You go mm-hmm. at it with your bare hand. Mm-hmm. The next thing you got to know, if you go at it with your bare hand and you don't get the grip, eat it and give the ball back to the pitcher because all you can do then is cause problems. Now you're giving up extra bases. You come across on a double play and you get the ball out your glove and you don't have the grip. Eat it. Sorry, the pitcher just going to have to make another pitch. That's better than you not having the grip and throwing that ball to first base and now he's got a chance to get to third. No, 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 no. Don't complicate the mistake. If you make a mistake and you try to Make up for that mistake, and when you tried to make up for that mistake, it didn't go right. Eat, you stop the, you stop the play right there. Get the mm-hmm. ball back to the pitcher. Let him make another pitch. And that's something that you've got to train for. You can't just talk about it. I mean, no, that comes you, you, that's that things you got to talk about. You, those are things right there you talk about because okay. you can't sim. You don't want to simulate him booting balls and picking them up. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't want to simulate yeah, boots it might and do picking that enough. up. Yeah. So you, you, what you can do is you can put them in position, like they're in a fielding position. You can drop a ball and let them get used to just picking it up. But mm. I'm not going to make you mistaken, not mistakenly, I'm not going to make you on purpose drop a ball to pick it up. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Because my job is and your job is to pick the ball up to catch it. Absolutely. And, boy, we got, I'm going to jump to a question here from – Slomo from Israel. Um, he would like, he he asks, um, would you eliminate a player right to second base because he's short? Do you think a kid can still play short if he's small, if he's a great fielder? And I'll add that, you know, arm strength also. Yes. Um, once again, it goes back to you can't limit what a kid is capable of doing, and you see he can do it. The time will come when Either he either can stay at shortstop or he have to move. But if his passion is at shortstop, you work him at shortstop if you feel like he can play shortstop. Excellent. Um, you know, the other, uh, another question is, at what level would you start implementing, you know, this is something that's happened a lot in the big leagues, the shift with infielders, or should, you know, you leave that to professional baseball? Um, I'll leave that to professional baseball only because – those kids are in the process of trying to learn how to play the game. So learn how to play the game first. If you get the opportunity to move up where these type of things are implemented, then you can make that adjustment. But in little league, high school, how many at-bats do those kids get to start putting on shifts? 
Not many. So they have to learn how to play the position for real. And as they get into pro ball, uh, look like they're trying to do it in college now. When they get there, it'll be an easy transition to shift. But you, you, how many young kids that you had enough at bats that you say he strictly pulled? Yeah, yeah. They don't well, have a bat speed yet. You got some young kids, don't get me wrong, that can get out front of a ball. Well, then that's where you take the second baseman and you can over, over move him. But don't be taking your short stops and putting him on the other side and doing all that crazy stuff. Yeah, no, I we agree. Do it, we do it because we got all kind of information. We got close to 15 to 2,000 to 3,000 ground balls that they done put in play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that adds up to that's where he's going to hit 80% of his balls. We don't care about the other 20%. We're going to cover the 80, and the other 20% is ground ball to third base, maybe ground ball on the shortstop side, which don't happen that often. You know, I was because thinking we – got, We got enough at-bats to say 80% of the time. We're playing 80%. 80% of the time, this is where he hits the ball, and that's what we cover. If you were looking at, from behind on plate to your defense and the pitch was coming in, what are you looking from your infielders and outfielders that they're doing right and possibly not good? Timing. I'm looking for the timing of contact. I'm mm -hmm. looking for timing of when the ball hit the contact zone. That's what I'm looking for. And like I said, you get ready any kind of way you want. As long as you're down on the ball of your feet when contact is made, now you can push and go either way. You can drop step. If it's a pop-up, you can go right, you can go left. You're ready to push and go wherever you want to go. So I'm looking for timing. I'm looking to see that they're on time. Okay. And also, well, folks, just so you know, we're pretty close to the end here. We've got about 10 more minutes. Um, so if you got questions, type them up. Uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook and also Twitter. And if you happen to miss and come back, it will be on YouTube. So don't worry about that. Ron, another area at infielders is the transfer. Um, you know, I see the Japanese players are really good at getting rid of the ball, man. They look like they got a strong arm because they get rid of it so fast. How much do you work on that? What's the important aspect, the key techniques there? The key aspect to turning a double play is catching the ball in the middle of your body. Mm -hmm. That's where your balance is. If you catch it in the middle of your body. Now, the middle of the body could mean that you got to throw towards you coming in for the double play. You at, you at second base, but you got to throw to the inside. You can still keep the ball to the middle of your body by taking your right leg to the ball. Your right leg is your key, wherever the ball is. If you're going to cross the bag, right leg go, catch the ball in the middle of your body. Mm. If the ball is behind the bag, you shift your body so the ball is always in the middle of your body. If you got to go across the bag, you go across the bag so you're with your right foot, you know, and catch the ball in the middle of your body. And then you just take your left foot, and that's going to be your direction. But everything is done in the middle of your body. About and I like you to, huh? And, and, and you go in and get the ball. You don't throw the ball in your hand. You catch it, you go in and get it. And in the process of going get it, when I'm doing my footwork at the bottom, I got time to get back here. Quickness happens in your technique. Quickness don't happen in your mindset. Mm. Where you thinking I gotta be quick, so you're gonna be quick. No, you're gonna be slower. Quickness <laughs> happens in your technique. If your technique is right, your quickness is going to happen. That's why I mentioned earlier about a three-step process. Mm -hmm. You catch it, you step, you throw. You catch it, you step, you throw, no matter where you catch it. You catch it, you step, you throw. And if you can get that sequence, and that sequence happens through practice, through practice, through practice. So and if you look, playing, go ahead. If you look at, at, at someone turning a double play, and you count the movement, if it's more than three, something is going to happen on the other end. Ah. So I count three movements. So when they're playing catch, when they're playing catch, um, we even got callers calling in. When you're playing catch, that's what you're working on, is that three-step yes. process constantly. Constantly. That's the repetition. And everything is centered. Even if I got to go sideways, I'm sideways now. The ball is thrown to the inside for a second baseman. But if I take my right foot to that ball, even though I'm sideways, look at my hands. They're still in the middle of my body. That's where my balance is. 
You mm. find guys leaving the ball. You find guys like this. They leaving the ball. You know what I'm saying? You find guys reaching out here and then coming back. But if you do everything in the center of your body, that's your balance. And you do it in a three-step process, catch, step, and throw. Whether you're catching the ball up here, whether you're catching the ball down low, it's still a three-step process. You know, it's interesting because uh, the question that we're going to probably end with this question. And at the end, I'm going to kind of open it up something we, I might not have asked an infield that you think is important. Um, but, you know, I know with uh, Oakland A's, you, you also work with first basemen. And folks, just so you know, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I was reading this. Eric Chavez in 204, he had, I believe he had six gold gloves. He gave Washington a gold glove. And on it, he wrote, he signed Wash, not without you. That's the ultimate compliment. And I just wanted to bring it up because you're not only good. People could tell you're good. But your players know you're good also. Well, the thing with Eric was um, when I first found that glove in my locker, I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. <laughs> so I picked it up, and I was walking to Eric Locker to give it back. Wow. And I happened to see the, what he wrote on the inside. So I continued to go to his locker, and my comment was, E, if, if, if there was no crying in baseball, I would be crying right now. Absolutely. Because someone asked me about four years earlier if I thought Eric Chavez could get a gold glove. And I said, Eric Chavez can do anything Eric Chavez wants. If wow. Eric Chavez want a gold glove, he can get a gold glove, but he's going to have to work at it. Well, Eric came and worked at it, and he got six. And I'm going to tell you this. If Eric Chavez wouldn't have hurt his back, he would have he had about 12 or 13 gold gloves. That's wow. how good he was. Wow. We had but one he did the work. He did the work. And that's the key. He did the work. Um, we had one question on, you know, I think at first base, you know, because always the question comes up when you go to your right, you know, do you go with your right foot or do you go with your left foot on the base? Um, does that really matter? Um, no. You have to develop footwork where you can make an adjustment. Sometimes you have to put your right foot there to get more distance. Sometimes you leave your left foot there to get more distance. It just depends on where the ball is. But what you do is, the key is, again, you center the bag. You don't play on one end or the other. You play on the middle of the bag at first base. That mm. way, any adjustment you have to make, whether the ball is going to the line or whether the ball is going to the outside, you're able to make the adjustment. But if you're not playing with the middle of the bag, you're going to lose range on one side of the bag. You know, and Ron, that's the key. And, and this is not critical because everybody makes mistakes at all levels. And I've got videotape. I can't tell you how much of it. First baseman's in the big leagues that do not use the whole bag, and the runner was safe. I mean, I could show them day in and day out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it but happens at once again, level. as a coach, you have to pay attention to the little things. Yeah. And when you see where you got a guy that's not using that whole bag to his advantage, you got to use the whole bag so if it goes to the line, you can work it. If it goes away from the line, you can work it. But if you work in one corner of the bag, you're weak on the other side. I'm trying to put strength on the whole bag. And that's why you work the middle of the bag. And it takes work. And you learn them. You teach them the footwork. You know, you throw balls in area where you have to change his feet, even though it might be the left foot on the bag and the right foot go out. But a ball is thrown where you have to use the right foot to get out there. You teach them all of these little bitty things. And when you see a, a guy doing something that's not right, you don't watch him do it like that. You stop it and get it right. See something, say something. Say something. I think that is so important. Um, Ron, listen, I know uh, tomorrow you guys start on the field in Atlanta. A lot of all the major league teams are at their home fields. you got to prepare. I can't thank you enough. Last-minute words, and then we'll close it off. Well, once again, just try to communicate. Just You don't have to be your, your, your player's friend or whomever you're working with. You don't have to be their friend, but you got to be consistent in what you want to have happen. And understand, it's your program. If it's not right in your program, who's at fault? you are yep. because it's your program 
the buck stops with you. And anything you see out there that you don't feel is right, you got to stop it and you got to make it right. I'm not going to forget that. See it and say something. Got to love it. Yeah. Ryan, can't thank you enough, man. God bless you. Thank you well, for coming. Thank you. And, and thank your fans out there for giving me an opportunity to talk baseball. I've, I've got these juices flowing. I'm ready to go, man. You hey, only got 60 games. I sure hope you play them. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we can have you back, and uh, it'd be great to have you, man. Because you well, Anytime. Anytime, Pete. Folks, Ron Washington, and also thank you, as he said, to all our folks on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you name it. Um, thank you, everybody, in the U.S. and around the world. Don't forget, just do us one favor. We just ask you to go to YouTube, register, help us out. The shows are free. Special thanks to Ron Washington. Special thanks to our producer, Brian Kroc, with the Lineup Media Group. I'm your host, Pete Caliendo. This is a show that loves interview baseball's best coaching minds who love the challenge status quo. God bless you all. Um, remember, uh, stay safe. We'll get you. We'll see you on the field. And though Major League Baseball starting soon, we're all excited. Thank you to Ron. See you on the next show, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Pete. Hey, Ron. Thank you. God bless you.